this is work that uh, Rujin and I have been pursuing uh, ever since um, the legalization of cannabis has been pursued in Canada. We, um, we are international lawyers. And so in that respect, um, we have always been, when talking about this issue, been very much focused about looking at the international legal context. And so during today's uh, brief presentation, our goal is going to be very much to walk you through the international treaty provisions that are related <clears throat> to cannabis legalization. Uh, and essentially, when Regime does that, we're going to be concluding that this move in Canada to legalize cannabis, while it might have had great merit from a public health, an economic perspective, even a political perspective, it is a move that has violated international law. And then what we'll do is we'll highlight as a second part of the presentation that it didn't necessarily have to be that way, in that Canada and the government could likely have achieved its policy objectives uh, without having violated international law. And third, I'll then uh, be talking about specifically about why that matters and how that, what that actually means for the future of uh, this area. And so with that, um, let me turn it over to um, Regine Habibi, who will be speaking about the treaty provisions. Regine. Great. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, so just moving on to the next slide. There might be a bit of a lag. Okay, perfect. So, sorry, there's a delay. All right, so I'll, I guess I'll begin by um, just setting the scene, um, talking a little bit about the international drug control regime and its architecture. Um, and so the international drug control regime, when we refer to it, what we're really referring to is three treaties um, that Canada is a party to and that has near universal adherence um, among members of the United Nations. So the first of these treaties is the 1961 Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs. It's also referred to more colloquially as the Single Convention. Um, and it was adopted in 1961, um, essentially to streamline previous international drug control agreements um, that you know, there were piecemeal agreements here and there. And so the single convention brought them all together. And that's why it's called the single convention, because it, it was supposed to harmonize and merge all of these disparate drug, con um, drug control treaties and agreements. Um, so that was in 1961 that it was adopted. Um, and what it did was it set the normative tone and the rules that prohibit the production, uh, use and trade of narcotic drugs. And um, by the 1970s, um, you start to see a dramatic use uh, of drugs and which prompted countries to convene again um, and to conclude two significant agreements. Um, the first of these was an amending protocol. So it's called the 1972 amending protocol and it modified the single convention in certain ways. So um, it had, uh, you know, it, it included a efforts to reduce the supply and demand of drugs. Um, it also included, inserted a more public health lens into the single convention, recognizing that um, drug dependence is a medical condition um, and that should be treated through education and rehabilitation. Um, the second agreement that was concluded was the 1971 Convention on Psychotropic Substances. Um, and this was essentially as a rise or in reaction to the high uptake of synthetic drugs, um, such as amphetamines. Um, and given that these substances were not previously scheduled or captured within the single convention, there was need for a new convention. And so the Psychotropics Convention reiterated mi with minor variations, many of the prohibitive provisions of the single convention. Um, and then finally, in 1988, countries convened again to adopt a convention addressing the rise in drug trafficking. Um, and uh, so this, this 1988 convention against illicit traffic in narcotic drugs and psychotropic substances um, was also known as the Trafficking Convention, provided for comprehensive measures such as extradition uh, and confiscation of assets um, to tackle illicit production and trafficking and demand for drugs. Now, these two treaties and their administrative bodies together form what we refer to as the international drug control regime. Um, and so, I'm, as just as a teaser, what, what the conclusion that, um, that Professor Hoffman and I made in the article that we shared, um, that I believe has been passed around as a reading, uh, in the Ottawa Law Review is that cannabis legalization does in fact violate several provisions of the international drug control regime. Um, and we explain how that happens in detail in that paper. But um, just to note that, uh, and I'm trying to change the slide here, oops, apologies. 
the single convention, uh, in the single convention, parties have this general obligation, it's Article 4C within the single convention, um, and it requires parties to take, and I quote, um, such legislative and administrative measures as may be necessary to limit exclusively to medical and scientific purposes the production, manufacture, export, import, distribution of, trade in, use, and possession of drugs. And so taken on its own, this general obligation does not require criminalization of drug possession and use, but it clearly discourages legalization um, by stating that parties must not permit uh, the possession of drugs except under legal authority. Um, moving along to the next key provision, um, this is Article 3, is Article 3.2 within the Trafficking Convention, um, and it's probably the most direct provision that requires uh, criminalization, or, or not requires, but, but alludes to a criminalization or punishable offense. So Article 3.2 states that parties must establish as criminal offenses under their domestic law, when committed intentionally, the possession, purchase, or cultivation of narcotic drugs or psychotropic substances for personal consumption, contrary to the provisions of the 1961 convention, that's the single convention, or the 1971 convention, that's the psychotropics convention. So in other words, what we're trying to convey by these two key provisions is that for over 180 countries in the world that have tried to try, uh, ratified the drug control treaties, there must be some form of prohibition on the possession of cannabis for recreational use. One interesting thing to note is that narcotic drugs, so quote unquote narcotic drugs or psychotropic substances are not explicitly defined um, within the drug control treaties. Um, but there are four schedules across the single convention and the psychotropics convention that have list that list certain drugs or certain, certain substances. Um, and this list can be can be revised and, and reviewed by a scientific committee of the WHO that's known as the Committee of uh, Experts on Drug Dependence. And when scheduling or descheduling a, a drug, that committee considers the potential therapeutic value of the substance as well as as well as its potential to induce drug dependency. So um, cannabis in particular uh, and cannabis resin was listed in Schedule 1 and Schedule 4 of the single convention. Um, so that means that it was subject to the most stringent control measures in the treaties. Um, this past December, uh, the WHO's expert committee met and, uh, and uh, recommended to uh, the Commission on Narcotic Drugs, which is the UN central drug policy making body, uh, that um, cannabis be removed from Schedule 4, which is the most stringent schedule. But the commission did not agree to remove cannabis from Schedule 1. So on a vote that um, on a vote among the 53 countries who are part of the Commission on Narcotic Drugs, 27 countries voted in favor of removing cannabis from Schedule 4 and 25 uh, voted against. So just wanted to show you that voting kind of that how that voting was split and one abstained. I wanted to show you that to kind of give some insight as to how polarizing um, views around inter in the international community are around cannabis um, and just around drug control in general. Um, of note, uh, Article 4C of the single convention still applies to all the drugs that are listed in Schedule 1, and that includes cannabis. Um, so moving on, um, I, the key conclusion is that cannabis does violate, uh, cannabis legalization does viol violate international law, but every treaty uh, and every international agreement, there must be some sort of leeway for countries in, to, in order to kind of um, to enforce their own sovereignty or to protect their own sovereignty as nations. And so the international drug control regime also has these sorts of flexibilities. And um, the first of these flexibilities, and I'm gonna go over three of them, but the first of these flexibilities is that we don't necessarily need to have criminal punishment. So the treaties don't specify that there has to be state punishment um, for the possession, use, and sale of drugs. And they don't specify exactly what that punishment must be if there is one. Um, and Portugal is taking advantage of this. So um, Portugal, for instance, prohibits drug use, but it diverts um, its offenders towards mandatory education and rehabilitation and treatment sessions and sometimes administrative fines. The other flexibility around here is that treaties um, 
are required to have in law some form of um, sanction, but they don't require countries to enforce those legal provisions. And so famously, this is the case of the Netherlands, where cannabis is actually prohibited by law or within the text of the law, but countries are not expected to enforce this provision prohibit, prohibition against people who use small quantities of it or possess small quantities. And the final flexibility here is that the treaties do allow for some constitutional override. And that means that not there's an expectation that countries um, are not, should not be violating their own constitutions in as they're fulfilling their duties to the drug control regime. And Bolivia took advantage of this flexibility by actually changing its constitution in 2009. So what it did Bolivia is that it, it came out of the drug control regime, changed its constitution in 2009 in order to allow for coca leaf to be possessed by citizens. It argued that this constitutional change was necessary because chewing coca leaf has an important cultural value for them. And then Bolivia re-exceeded again to the to the relevant provisions of the treaties with um, with uh, with reservations around coca leaf and the chewing of coca leaf. Um, with respect to narcotic, with respect to cannabis in particular, the International Narcotics Control Board has stated um, very bluntly and continues to maintain this position that there is no uh, flexibility in the conventions for allowing or the regulation of any kind of use uh, for personal use. And the International Drug Control, uh, just to kind of clarify, the International Narcotics Control Board is responsible for monitoring and enforcing compliance with the treaties. Their latest report, so if you go to their website, they have annual reports every year that outlines the state of, international, uh, of the international drug control regime. And in their latest 2019 report, they also commented, again, that they remain concerned at the legislative developments permitting the use of cannabis for recreational uses. Not only are these developments in contravention of the drug control conventions, but the commitments and the commitments made by state parties, but there are consequences for health and well-being, especially of young people. And so just to, stay, just to kind of give you some insight, the INCB is now starting to move in the direction of looking at the public health impact of cannabis on young people. So that's the, I guess that's the, um, if you will, the line of concern or argumentation that now they're um, putting forward. Uh, and uh, there are a few countries who famously do have regulated markets for cannabis or some jurisdictions within countries who have those. Um, and some who, many more countries who are headed in that direction. So you have countries like Bermuda and Mexico um, and others contemplating some form of legalization. Uh, there are varied logics behind these different kinds of markets. And so in the United States, you have um, several, uh, several states have some form of decriminalization or legalization for non-medical use. And more states voted in 2000 and, uh, in this November election in 2020 to overturn um, uh, legal, to, to allow for legalization or decriminalization. And this number is only expected to rise in the U.S. There seems to be just a, a, a large public appetite to, to change things, um, especially at the state level. This may, be, this may seem, what happens in the U.S. may seem like a bit of a paradox because the U.S. has historically been one of the most um, fiercest defenders of the international drug control regime. But the U.S. defends itself against scrutiny by invoking its unique criminal law system. Um, so in, in the U.S., criminal law is really, uh, it it's, it's, um, trickles down to the states. It's with it at the state level it's decided, which is obviously not the case in Canada, where our system is largely decided at the federal level. Um, and Australia also similarly followed um, a similar logic. So in 2019, Australia's national capital territory also legalized the possession and growth of small amounts of cannabis um, for recreational use. Um, and so there is this understanding that in federalist countries, maybe the the sub, you know, the sub, um, the sub governments, so the, the provincial or state governments can make certain of their own decisions. But there is a principle also within international law that even among federalist countries, the onus is on the federal government to ensure that its cons constituents abide by their international obligations. Um, and so in any event, this logic for the US and Australian uh, system doesn't really apply to Canada because our federal system is not organized in the same way. Uh, the last uh, the last thing to note is Uruguay. Um, so Uruguay is the only um, country that has a proper regulated market for can of, of, can of this for the sale of mo uh, cannabis for non-medical or recreational use um, that doesn't kind of have these loopholes. But Uruguay has um, grounded its legalization um, its, its legalization efforts in the fact that it um, that that it was necessary in order for them to fulfill their human rights obligations. And even this argument is a little bit tenuous because of the principle that 
that there is also in international law that specific obligations do trump um, general obligations. So when there is a specific obligation with respect to drugs or cannabis, it is arguably that the country must follow that specific obligation as opposed to the more general obligations of international human rights law. Um, uh, so just moving on to the next slide and conscious of time. Oops, sorry. I'm going to hand it over to Stephen. Great. Perfect. Regine, thanks so much uh, for that. Um, so I think uh, essentially, and we didn't keep you in suspense, uh, essentially, um, based on what Regine has explained, it's very clear that Canada is actually violating uh, more than one international law by having legalized cannabis. I think in many respects, um, that's actually not a, on one hand, it's maybe not the thing that many people anticipated because of course um, Canadians uh, think of themselves as law-abiding citizens. We think of ourselves as a international legally up uh, upholding country, um, but it's actually also not a very controversial conclusion in the sense that the second reading that goes along with this presentation uh, is um, a report from the Canadian Senate uh, which highlights uh, and um, the, these international legal implications. Uh, Regine and I both contributed um, to the developments of that report and its conclusion is very much that we're going to be, that we will, that we are now currently violating these treaties and even the governments um, of the day um, uh, when presenting to that Senate committee, so, the, uh, so Minister Christia Freeland, who at the time was Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, she acknowledged that uh, we would actually be in violation of these treaties after legalization uh, went through. And so in that respect, um, we're maybe highlighting something that might be surprising to some, but it's actually not a very controversial conclusion. What I did want to emphasize though is before we talk about why all this matters is that we didn't have to violate this, these treaties when legalizing cannabis. Regine highlighted the various flexibilities and the different ways that other countries have sort of gotten around these international legal uh, obligations in, in achieving its policy objectives without actually violating the international law. But there's even if we decided we didn't wanna make use of one of those flexibilities, there are additional mechanisms Canada could have pursued that would be complementary to these treaties. The first would be, for example, to seek an amendment to the treaties. And I think that makes a lot of good sense in the sense that these are old treaties. They were developed at a very different time. The treaties are really scientifically outdated. They refer to addiction as being evil, whereas today I think everyone, everyone knows it's a medical challenge. Uh, these are not good treaties. They have a lot of provisions that are rather onerous and don't reflect the kind of public health response that most people would say is the more appropriate response to this challenge. We could have sought the amendment of the treaties. Now that being said, uh, that likely would have taken some time. There are, for example, 32 countries around the world that have the death penalty for drug smuggling. I don't think those countries would have been very open to amending the treaties in the way that Canada might have sought, but we could have tried. Second, we could have tried to provide some creative justifications. As Regine mentioned, uh, the provisions of the International Drug Control Treaties do allow for uh, cannabis and other drug use on the basis of scientific and medical basis. And so one argument the government could have brought forward, maybe a little bit of a stretch, but they could have argued that, well, this is part of a grand scientific experiment, a natural experiment to see about the intergenerational effects of cannabis or something. Uh, that would have said that, that this legalization effort is actually a scientific purpose. And it's actually not such a crazy suggestion. Um, there is case law from the International Court of Justice that does interpret what, the, what it means for scientific purposes. Uh, one case is the um, international whaling case that was brought forward um, against Japan with respect to its whaling practices uh, in the Whaling Treaty Convention. And so uh, there is a legal, there is case law around that. And so it is maybe a bit creative, but it's not crazy. The third one, which is maybe a little even more crazy, um, it's one that um, uh, Rujin and I wouldn't be, uh, think is too viable of an option, but one that has been discussed by some folks in the community is around making use of a mechanism called an inter se agreement. So in international treaty law, one option is that countries can 
Um, in addition to their treaty obligations, they can actually come up with sort of side agreements among a smaller group of member, of member states, allowing for usually it's to pursue even further restrictions or further requirements. There has been some people who've suggested, well, maybe that mechanism could be used to actually alleviate some requirements if enough countries bound together and made their own sort of amendments to treaties. Now that would be totally uncharted legal territory. There's not a single example of doing it, but it has been an idea that has been put forward, one that I thought to raise here. It's not one I, I personally don't think that that would fly. Uh, that being said, if we can't amend the treaty, we can't come up with creative justifications. We, this, we couldn't make use of this very, very creative mechanism of inter se agreement, then we also as a country could have withdrawn from the treaties. These, as I said earlier, these are not great treaties. They're old, they're outdated, they don't reflect current science on these issues. They certainly don't represent the government's view of what these treaties should be. And as a result, we could have withdrawn from them. And indeed, actually, we then could have rejoined them. We could have reacceded to them. And when you rejoin treaties, or when you, sorry, when you accede to a treaty, you have an opportunity to make reservations to those treaties. And so we actually could have withdrawn and then reacceded, but not accepting these provisions as they relate to cannabis. Ultimately, though, the government decided not to do that. And so on the next slide, um, I'll just emphasize that ultimately we are violating international law. And why does this matter? Well, there's some major, there are some major consequences. I think if we go to the next slide, I'll just quickly flag that those major consequences, and it pains me to say this as an international lawyer, they don't have immediate effect on the current legal practice that many of you might be facing in Canada when it comes to a domestic regulated cannabis market. So in that sense, what I mean is that in Canada, we have not domestically incorporated these international drug control treaties, although as a country, we are clearly in violation of them. And so in that respect, there is no immediate effect. But the challenge is that if we start to pick and choose which international treaties to follow, it then encourages other countries to do the same. And so one of the longer term implications of violating international laws when it comes to cannabis is that there's a whole series of other international laws that we care a whole lot about, whether it's about human rights, whether it's about the oceans, climate change, whether it's nuclear weapons. And so we don't wanna be, we don't wanna be undermining this system of international law, which despite all of its imperfections, it remains the strongest mechanism we have to solve the global challenges that we face of the day. Uh, most of my work, uh, well, all my work is in the global health field. A lot of my work relates to infectious diseases. And so we're living right now through a global pandemic. It would be in everyone's best interest, every country's best interest to have strong international legal system to have greater clarity for how we solve these various issues such as today's pandemic. But I also wanted to flag that from a legal practice perspective, while it's not immediately affecting a domestic regulated cannabis market in Canada, the norms that it, this international drug control regime espouses will indirectly have effects on the Canadian market in at least a couple of ways. One is that we know that the courts do often interpret Canadian legislation in light of Canada's international legal obligations. And so it's not, not uh, directly applicable, but it is part of a purposive interpretation of Canada's domestic legislation and regulation. The second is also that I'm sure Canadian companies uh, are going to be increasingly looking beyond Canada's borders uh, in order, um, uh, well, as part of their business. Uh, and so it's extremely important that companies are highly aware that Canada remains not only an outlier in terms of its current legal regime, but actually there's international law, international legal norms, very much against this whole thing. Now, again, I'm not saying that those are good norms, and indeed those norms are very quickly changing. But the recent vote uh, that uh, Rougine mentioned uh, in Vienna highlights how polarized the world really is on this issue, and companies and lawyers working in this space need to know about that. So with that, uh, I'll, um, I'll conclude and I hope there are still a few moments uh, for any questions and answers that might be there. Thanks so much again for the opportunity. Looking forward to the discussion.